अ क्लोज अ लुक हम्पी मसूली पटनम एंड सूरत द आर्किटेक्चुरल स्प्लेंडर ऑफ हम्पी हम्पी इज लोकेटेड इन द कृष्णा तुंगभद्रा बेसन विच फॉर्म्ड द न्यूक्लियस ऑफ द विजयनगर एम्पायर फाउंडेड इन थर्टीन थर्टी सिक्स द मैग्निफिशेंट रूएंस एट हम्पी रिवील अ वेल फोर्टिफाइड सिटी नो मोटर अ सीमेंटिंग एजेंट वॉज यूज इन द कंस्ट्रक्शन ऑफ दीज वॉल्स एंड द टेक्निक फॉलोड वॉज टू वेज दम टूगेदर बाय इंटरलॉकिंग द आर्किटेक्चर ऑफ हम्पी वॉज डिस्टिंगटिव The buildings in the royal complex had splendid arches, domes, and pillared halls with niches for holding sculptures. They also had well-planned orchards and pleasure gardens with sculptural motifs such as the lotus and cobbles. In its heyday in the 15th, 16th centuries, Hampi bustled with commercial and cultural activities. Moors, a name used collectively for Muslim merchants. Chetis and agents of European traders, such as the Portuguese, thronged the markets of Hampi. Temples were the hub of cultural activities, and Dev Dasis, that is, temple dancers, performed before the deity, royalty, and masses in the many pillared halls in the Virupaksha, which is a form of Shiva temple. The Mahanavmi festival, known today as Navratri in the south. was one of the most important festivals celebrated at Hampi. Archaeologists have found the Mahanavmi platform where the king received guests and accepted tribute from subordinate chiefs. From here he also watched dance and music performances as well as wrestling bouts. Hampi fell into ruin following the defeat of Vijayanagar in 1565 by the Deccani sultans, the rulers of Golconda. Bijapur, Ahmednagar, Berar, and Bidar. A fortified city. This is how a Portuguese traveller, Domingo Pais, described Hampi in the 16th century. At the entrance of the gate, where those pass who come to Goa, this king has made within it a very strong city, fortified with walls and towers. These walls are not like those of other cities. but are made of very strong masonry such as would be found in few other parts and inside very beautiful rows of buildings made after their manner with flat roofs a gateway to the west surat surat in gujarat was the emporium of western trade during the mughal period along with kambe which is present day khambhat and somewhat later ahmedabad emporium is a place where goods from diverse production centers are bought and sold surat was the gateway for trade with west asia via the gulf of ormuz surat has also been called the gate to mecca because many pilgrim ships set sail from here the city was cosmopolitan and people of all castes and creeds lived here In the 17th century the Portuguese, Dutch and English had their factories and warehouses at Surat. According to the English chronicler Ovington who wrote an account of the port in 1689 on average 100 ships of different countries could be found anchored at the port at any given time. There were also several retail and wholesale shops selling cotton textiles. The textiles of Surat were famous for their gold lace borders that is zari and had a market in West Asia, Africa and Europe. The state built numerous rest houses to take care of the needs of people from all over the world who came to the city. There were magnificent buildings and innumerable pleasure parks. The Kathiawar Seths or Mahajans that is money changers had huge banking houses at Surat. It is noteworthy that the Surat Hundis were honored in the far off markets of Cairo in Egypt, Basra in Iraq and Antwerp in Belgium. Hundi is a note recording a deposit made by a person. The amount deposited can be claimed in another place by presenting the record of the deposit. However, Surat began to decline towards the end of the 17th century. This was because of many factors. 
the loss of markets and productivity because of the decline of the Mughal Empire, control of the sea routes by the Portuguese, and competition from Bombay, which is present-day Mumbai, where the English East India Company shifted its headquarters in 1668. Today, however, Surat is a bustling commercial centre. Fishing in Troubled Waters Masuli Patnam The town of Masuli Patnam or Machli Patnam, literally fish port town, lay on the delta of the Krishna River. In the 17th century, it was the centre of intense activity. Both the Dutch and the English East India companies attempted to control Masuli Patnam as it became the most important port on the Andhra coast. The fort at Masuli Patnam was built by the Dutch. The Qutub Shahi rulers of Golconda imposed royal monopolies on the sale of textiles, spices and other items to prevent the trade passing completely into the hands of the various East India companies. Fierce competition among various trading groups, the Golconda nobles, Persian merchants, Telugu Komti Chettis and European traders made the city populous and prosperous. As the Mughals began to extend their power to Golconda, their representative, the governor Mir Jumla, who was also a merchant, began to play off the Dutch and the English against each other. In 1686-1687, Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb annexed Golconda. This caused the European companies to look for alternatives. It was a part of the new policy of the English East India Company that it was not enough if a port had connections with the production centres of the hinterland. The new company trade centres, it was felt, should combine political, administrative and commercial roles. As the company traders moved to Bombay, Calcutta, which is present-day Kolkata, and Madras, which is present-day Chennai, Masuli Patnam lost both its merchants and prosperity and declined in the course of the 18th century, being today nothing more than a dilapidated little town. A Poor Fisher Town This is a description of Masuli Patnam by William Methworld a factor of the English East India Company in 1620. Factor is an official merchant of the East India Company. This is the chief port of Golconda where the right worshipful East India Company have their agent. It is a small town but populous, unwalled, ill-built and worse situated within all the springs are brackish. It was first a poor fisher town, afterwards the convenience of the road a place where ships can anchor, made it a residence for merchants and so continues since R and the Dutch nation frequented this coast. New Towns and Traders In the 16th and 17th centuries, European countries were searching for spices and textiles which had become popular both in Europe and West Asia. The English, Dutch and French formed East India Companies in order to expand their commercial activities in the East. Initially, great Indian traders like Mullah Abdul Ghaffur and Virji Vora, who owned a large number of ships, competed with them. However, the European companies used their naval power to gain control of the sea trade and forced Indian traders to work as their agents. Ultimately, the English emerged as the most successful commercial and political power in the subcontinent. The spurt in demand for goods like textiles led to a great expansion of the crafts of spinning, weaving, bleaching, dyeing, etc. with more and more people taking them up. Indian textile designs became increasingly refined. However, this period also saw the decline of the independence of craftspersons. They now began to work on a system of advances which meant that they had to weave cloth which was already promised to European agents. Weavers no longer had the liberty of selling their own cloth or weaving their own patterns. They had to reproduce the designs supplied to them by the company agents. The 18th century saw the rise of Bombay, Calcutta and Madras, which were nodal cities today.
crafts and commerce underwent major changes as merchants and artisans such as weavers were moved into the black towns established by the European companies within these new cities. The blacks or native traders and craftspersons were confined here while the white rulers occupied the superior residencies of Fort St. George in Madras or Fort St. William in Calcutta. The story of crafts and commerce in the 18th century will be taken up next year. Vasco da Gama and Christopher Columbus In the 15th century, European sailors undertook unprecedented explorations of sea routes. They were driven by the desire to find ways of reaching the Indian subcontinent and obtaining spices. Vasco da Gama, a Portuguese sailor, was one of those who sailed across the Atlantic to the African coast, went round it, crossing over to the Indian Ocean. His first journey took more than a year. He reached Calicut in 1498 and returned to Lisbon, the capital of Portugal, the following year. He lost two of his four ships and of the 170 men at the start of the journey, only 54 survived. In spite of the obvious hazards, the routes that were opened up proved to be extremely profitable and he was followed by English, Dutch and French sailors. The search for sea routes to India had another unexpected fallout. On the assumption that the earth was round, Christopher Columbus, an Italian, decided to sail westwards across the Atlantic Ocean to find a route to India. He landed in the West Indies, which got their name because of this confusion, in 1492. He was followed by sailors and conquerors from Spain and Portugal, who occupied large parts of Central and South America, often destroying earlier settlements in the area. Subscribe to my channel. Click on bell icon to get notification about new videos.